The title here is Accelerated Software Delivery. What I'm actually going to talk about is DevOps, Agile, CI, CD, and some lessons we learned the hard way. So I'm not going to talk about the tooling and the, the individual bits and bytes. I'm going to come up a couple of levels and talk about things like the, the culture and our experience and some of the things we've learned. So what I'll do is I'll cover a bit about a bit of an introduction, then a bit about what the problem is, the background, what the problem we're trying to solve or we tried to solve, what the answer is, um, and then a couple of sort of little lessons at the end, a little sting in the tail, a little bit of a gotcha watch out for at the end. So this is me. I, I send this picture out regularly. No one's ever disappointed when they see me in person. So apart from starring in Thor and a number of other films, I'm actually the, the head of strategy and architecture for Allianz in, in the UK. I started off as a, main, a lowly mainframe programmer and worked my way through all sorts of IT across, across Allianz in the insurance industry, having started in the travel industry. Allianz itself is not a particularly well-known brand in the UK. It's very well known in Europe across the world. 140 odd thousand employees, 88 million customers, 70, it's actually 73 countries now because we've just signed a deal in Africa. 126 billion euros worth of turnover. Depending on how you count, according to which year it is, in the Forbes 500, we're the 33rd, 34th largest company in the world um, and the largest financial services company. Um, and there are some lovely figures there. So this is the business bit, so I thought I'd better put some numbers up to keep everybody happy. A Cu couple of things that are worth pointing out here because it makes us quite smug. Um, it is effectively the return on equity is very good for us. And, and for an insurance company, solvency to capitalisation, really, really important. That's how much money we've got in the bank to pay out claims. And you can see that's sitting at 218%. So the message here is this is a company that's been around for 125 years. It is financially sound. It is robust. It is the classic model of an insurance company. But we do a bit more than that. So um, for those of you who might have seen the drone racing, we now sponsor drone racing. Um, we sponsor Hollywood and Bollywood movies, so we've, we did all the last three James Bond films, and we're currently insuring the next James Bond film. The Aston Martin, they smashed in the last film, was one we insured. It's very annoying. Uh, <laughs> we, we now sponsor the, you, will, you might have seen the Allianz brand in the Formula One all across the pit lanes. We now sponsor eSports and the electronic car racing that's coming to London later next year. Uh, we do micro insurance across Africa and India. We ensure most of the things that go into space. We ensure three of the world's tourist buildings. Um, and we ensure the Titanic. Uh, we also ensured the San Francisco earthquake and a large part of it. And we also ensured two Malayan airlines that got lost a year before last. But that's what insurance is for. This is a traditional image of insurance. This is what insurance looks like. Lloyd's Coffee House, uh, 1686, not too far from here. Um, sailors, ship owners, and the wealthy classes used to meet. Uh, and a lot of the terms that we talk about in insurance, a lot of the functions we have in insurance actually date from here. So the concept of underwriting is the term where the person putting their money up for the bill would, would put their name underneath the schedule. They would underwrite the schedule of insurance. So a lot of the terms, a lot of the ideas come from this. But insurance has changed massively since 1686. Here's a picture of Lloyd's. Yeah, there's a picture of the coffee house. Look at the paperwork. Look at the people. Oh, look at the paperwork. Look at the people. Um, but it hides a bit of a truth here, because actually in insurance terms, we divide up between the concept of manufacturing. So this is the idea of having the capital to write the insurance. And actually, the manufacturing <laughs> process has not changed very much. You have a brand, you have a product, you have a channel, you have a customer. There's a, local, there's a local branch of High Street form cash key. So there's a distribution part to it and a manufacturing part. At the manufacturing side, you need capital in the bank. One of the reasons why insurance is perceived as a, as a slightly protected industry is it's very hard to get into insurance because the amount of capital you need to get an insurance license is very difficult. What is changing is the distribution method. So if you look on this if, and you go back five years, 10 years, direct line telephone adverts, telephone face-to-face. -face. For your personal insurance, you would go and see a broker. You wouldn't buy it online. Um, 1986, 87 was the first direct insurance. That's not that long ago. Um, you would send a cash in, you would send a check in. You know, the man from the Prue. It's those sorts of things. Now, 
we're talking digital, we're talking online, we're, we're thinking about SEO, we're talking web quote and buy, auto quote, we're talking about credit cards and PayPal. It is a much faster environment. We're talking about automatic midterm adjustments, automatic processes. As a customer, you want to be dealt with very quickly, very effectively, and in a digital way. So what you've, what you've seen, even in the last short period of time, is a fundamental shift in the way customers in the insurance market are engaged with. Whether you're dealing with commercial insurance through a broker or personal insurance to an individual, the engagement model is very, very different. So I think I was talking to one of the CloudBees guys earlier about Pet Plan, which is one of our brands. Two years ago, we used to send out an annual magazine to pet owners. Now it's a digital magazine because people would write in and say they don't want a paper magazine. So it just shows that the, the speed of change in this, this industry is incredibly fast. The, the UK insurance market is one of the most competitive in the world. You know, look at how much pe money is spent by you know, compare the market, for example, or any one of the other aggregators. It's a vicious and expensive market. So this idea that insurance is still the same as it always was, it's a protected environment, it's very slow, it's very dull, is simply not true. My, my daughter um, informed me one day, and this is one of the things, if you've got kids, they have great ability to take you down, and said, I don't know what you know about careers, Dad, you work in the two most boring things in the world, IT and insurance. <laughs> So what I'm trying to say is actually that's a deceptive position to be in. So the, the sorts of speed of software delivery and the speed of process is really, really important. So what's the problem we're facing? The problem we're facing is that the standard software approach is not designed for speed. It's designed for precision and predictability. So if you go back to the to the world where software started to, started to grow, been nascent in its form. It was about predictability. It was about uh, administration processes. It was about underwriting and insurance terms. It was about reserving. It wasn't about customer engagement. So what you need there is a level of predictability and accuracy. If you're running an insurance company, one of the last things you want to do is have a reserving process that says, let's see how quickly we can bang the numbers in. If as long as we're there or thereabouts and got the right amount of money-ish, we'll be fine. That's not the right answer. I was sitting next to a lady from the FCA earlier today. That's not the right answer, just, just to be clear. So, so software processes are about predictability. This is a chart that NASA developed actually in 1977. It's called the Code of Uncertainty. What they did is they looked at their projects and they said, why are they always so far off where are we estimated? And this is a, this is a method you can apply to anything from painting your bathroom to emptying the shed to cutting the grass to whatever you like. The, the principle is the same. And what it says is, at the beginning when you start this process, you haven't got much of a clue what you're doing. So therefore you don't understand particularly what it is you're getting into. So, you know, you can imagine NASA in, in, the, in the late 60s trying to fly to the moon. Not much of a clue what it was they were doing and how to work it. So your estimates at this point are anything up to four times out. Then you go through a process of starting to understand how it works. So if you go back to painting, painting the bathroom, what you'd say is, what my wife would say to me is, oh, it'll take you a couple of hours. Okay? That's probably true. But then I've got to empty it out, you've got to mastic the wind, you've got to put tape all over the windows, you've got to clear everything, you've got newspaper over the bath, you've got to go and buy the paint. So actually that two hours isn't two hours at all. When you start to think through the complexity of what it is you've got to do. And then you go to design. And once you get to product design specification, you finish your design work, you've got a good idea, you're sort of a quarter out, 0.25 out. And then as you build it, it gets easier and easier and easier to the point where you've delivered it and you know exactly how long it's going to take you to deliver it because you've delivered it. Now, that process is fine if you're doing underwriting, if you're doing reserving, if you're building rockets to go to the moon, that works really well. If you need to speed things up, what you've got to get to a point of moving that line to the left so that you understand much more quickly what it is you've got to deliver and how much time and effort it's going to take you. And here's the problem. It is that classic triangle of work. You can have it fast, you can have it cheap, you can have it great. If you want combinations, 
it becomes a bit difficult. You can have fast and cheap, but your quality is going to go. You can have fast and great, but that's going to cost you money. You can have cheap and great, but that's going to take you a long time. And then in the middle, they're not at home, give it up. So apparently, the silver bullet to this is Agile and DevOps. So what we started to do was look at how we can take out all of the weight out of the software development, the classic CI, CD process. How do you take out the weight? How do you, how do you build the automation? And how do you put on top of that the project capability that allows you to be more agile? So these are the things we learned. Now, I'm going to go through this and you're going to say, yeah, that's all obvious. So anyone got kids doing exams at the moment? GCSEs, A-levels, university exams, yeah? And, and doing professional exams yourselves? What do they say when you do exams? They, so the, the teacher will say, and I said this to my son yesterday morning as he had his first physics exam, don't forget to read through the paper, read the questions, and then at the end, read your answers through to make sure you've not made any silly mistakes. Dead obvious stuff. Really, really boring. I bet you said it to your kids for, the, for their first exam. The teachers said it to their kids for their exams. What are the top two reasons that, that students do not perform in the exams as expected? They don't read the questions and they don't read it through afterwards. Why? Because in the excitement of the event, with the adrenaline rush, those sorts of obvious things get forgotten. So the, these are a couple of obvious things which I'm going to say because they are really fundamentally important. And if you're starting to deploy CI, CD, you're starting to expand CI and CD, you're starting to expand your agile environment, and you're starting to bend on some of these, you need to think twice. And I'm saying that because that's what we did and we learned the hard way. So the first of these is you absolutely have to commit to doing it. You can't half jump out of an aeroplane you can't half do CI and CD. There is, you don't get any value from, oh, I'll tell you what, we'll CI and CD our test environment um, and leave it at that. And then we'll see what benefit we get and then we'll go for development and production after that. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. You need to commit to doing it. If you're going to continuously integrate, if you're going to continuously develop, commit to it and do it. Common view of the same thing. Really important. Very hard for large organisations like us that operates with an offshore contingent because in the old world, operating in a waterfall environment with work packages that go offshore to be delivered is a cost-effective way of delivering stuff. When you start to think about agile DevOps CI CD, you need to have co-location. Co-location generally means with the product owner, with the business specialist, with the SME in the UK. That breaks a very traditional, very well-established and very effective model. But it's absolutely fundamental. You have to have the same view of what you're doing. One down there. This is a really important one. When, you, when you're recruiting astronauts, you don't just tend to pick up any passing Muppet that happens to be on the street and say, tell you what you'll do, I come out. I didn't mean to point at you. I'm going to say you're a Muppet, sorry. Um, <laughs> the... the that will do and do the job. They are highly skilled, highly capable people going through a recruitment process to make sure that you get them the best skilled people for the job. That's what you need in the same environment. You can't necessarily take the same group of people from over here and put them into a DevOps environment over there if they don't fit. Many, most, will make the transition without a problem at all and be absolutely fine. A few will not, and you cannot make do. It's a different working environment. It's a different set of principles. So you need to think very carefully about how you deploy the individuals to the teams and how you make that work. And this is the first of my tool comments. So from a tooling point of view, it's a bit like the astronauts. There are a whole load of functions and capabilities and features and and, and technical abilities that you need to build a proper pipeline, to build a, a, a DevOps environment. You need to build the right, you need to use the right tool for the right thing. Don't make do. If you make do, you will come unstuck. So you have to make sure that you're picking the right thing for the right job. If you've got a code repository, use it as a code repository. If you've got a communication tool, use it as a communication tool. Don't use your comms tool as a document repository because it happens to be able to do it. Make, make sure you're choosing correctly. 
So here's a set of things that we learned during the process as a result of that. You have to think about how you onboard people. So if you're moving from a waterfall world to a DevOps world to an agile world, it's a different way of thinking about things. Whether you're, you're talking to a technician or to a business owner, to a product owner, to an SME, to a senior manager, it is a different way of thinking about how those processes work. So do not underestimate the amount of time and effort you need to spend working with those people, not necessarily the technicians. So if you think about a waterfall world, the senior manager, the head of the product, the head of claims or whatever it happens to be, will be used to seeing a, a report on his project that says milestone X, milestone Y, milestone Z, it's red, amber, green, it's going to hit it, it's going to not hit it. You then go to an environment, and I, and I will I'll make it a little bit cartoon to make the point, that says, you're going to spend two million quid. I'm not quite sure what you'll get at the end of that, but you'll get a lot of what you want. Maybe not all of those 10 things you wanted, maybe eight of them, maybe 11 of them. Not really sure. We'll see how it goes. It's a very different methodology and a very different mindset. Um, and if you're in a, in a traditional hierarchical organisation, that makes things quite uncomfortable. So you need to spend a bit of time making sure that, that your, your team and your management team are very aware of the consequences of what they're doing. So this one is where I get out of my soapbox. So you remember, if you, if you were awake at the beginning, I said I was head of strategy and architecture for the UK. Bloody architecture. So DevOps and Agile is not make it up as you go along, let the technician plug boxes in how he wants to. It's not that. It's not that. It's not that. There is architecture involved in the process at the beginning. You sort of have to know what it is you're building in order to be able to build it. You can't make it up as you go along. If you're having a house built or an extension done, your builder doesn't pitch up and say, don't worry about it, we'll work out where the windows go as we go, we'll think about it, we might make it six feet, we might make it ten feet, we'll wing it. No, 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 no. Architecture, 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 in the right place, to the right level, at the right time, which is, by the way, at the beginning, not the end. Architecture does not happen when you draw a picture of what it is you've slammed together. Architecture happens at the beginning when you do the design work for the capability and the functions that you're going to build because you're not building something alone. You're building something that should form a set of things and a set of capabilities that the organisation is going to have going forward. You go back to the extension idea, if you F up your foundations and your, your, found, your extension falls over, you're not going to be best pleased. That's why you do the architecture at the beginning. That's why you think about how deep your foundations are going to be. Link to that is this one. So th this is about discipline. So in an agile and CD world, I would argue that discipline is more important more critical and more fundamental than in a waterfall world. You have to run your stand-ups, you have to do the right documentation, you have to do the right things in the right way at the right time, you have to communicate effectively. In a waterfall world, it's less important. There is a view that if you do agile, you wing it, you make it up as you go along, you don't have to worry too much about documentation, you don't have to worry too much about the bloody architects because they're always in the way telling you you can't do things. You don't have to worry about security, you just get on with it. Um, and it's self-documenting, it's fine. If you want to know how it works, just look at the code, it's fine. No, not really. If you want to operate an agile environment very effectively, it's more disciplined, it's more organised. It just doesn't look it. Because you've got to run your stand-ups, you've got to run your scrums, you've got to run your communications, you've got to run your backlog. And if you're not doing those things properly with rigour and with form, it all comes unstuck. And, and this is the bit, I, so I did this presentation before another CloudBees event. I got into trouble for saying this. Um, but I'm going to say it again, just because it amuses me. Um, there are lots of tools that do the same thing out there um, in the space. So you can have a theological war about whether you use Jabber or, or any other tool that does the same thing. It doesn't bloody matter. Just pick one. You can always swap it later particularly if it's a tool that doesn't go into the production environment, just pick one. Because you can spend a lot of time doing tool selection, doing RFPs, speaking to vendors. You need to do that. You need to do it properly and with a degree of rigour. But don't spend a huge amount of time on it. 
You can swap the tool set out at a later date if you need to. Just do one and get it moving. So here's a, here's a couple of things. So this is what tends to happen. You pitch up, we need three more programmers, use Agile. It's not just a way of doing more work with fewer people. Find me something that does mean that. I think there is an, there is an idea that allows that because you're talking about throughput, because you're talking about speed of delivery, you therefore need less people. That isn't necessarily true. You need the right skilled people and you need the right people deployed in the right places on the team. It isn't necessarily less. It might be, but it isn't necessarily. Because what you're trading is not, not capacity, it's throughput and speed. So you're getting more functions, more build, more throughput with the same amount of resource. You're not necessarily wanting to, to constrain your pipeline by having fewer people. But again, I won't say necessarily. In some cases it might mean that, but it doesn't necessarily. But there is a world, a wonderful assumption that says, because you're doing Agile, you only need five people when you've got ten at the moment. And once you've done one or two, it gets worse. It all goes horribly wrong. Because, and I think, I think Mr Accenture this morning talked about it, there's this concept of a tiger team. The first few iterations of a, of a DevOps continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline that you deploy has a lot of focus. It has your technical and technical specialists. It'll have your security people crawling all over it. It'll have senior management involvement. It'll have your best developers who are all keen to be involved in it. And that works really well because you've got the ability to unblock things, you've got the right skills in place, you've got the right people, and it all goes well. When you come to start rolling out, and this is the, this is the problem we face, when you start to come and roll out DevOps Team 3, DevOps Team 4, DevOps Team 5, it's all a bit boring, no one's that interested. The senior management have moved on to something else more interesting. The security team are a bit more relaxed about it. And you get a dip because it becomes harder. All of that focus has gone. And you have to work through that, drive through some coordination, and then you come back up again. Now, the only way to avoid that is actually to try and keep that level of focus at the same level on the way through. But it is hard. So here's my summary. If you want the benefits, you have to commit. You need to make sure that your people have the same view of the same thing at the same time. And if you're doing agile, that means co-location. You need to be really careful to make sure you've got the right skills and the right people for the job. And you can't fix things without the right tools. Don't try and fix things with the wrong tools or make do. Um, spend time on boarding. Think about the cultural change. Um, architecture, 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 architecture. I've got that message across. Architecture is really important. Um, discipline, rigour, process. Um, and just pick the tool that fits your hand best. <laughs>